Coming up on Discover Wisconsin, we're taking a look at our dairy evolution. From humble, hardworking beginnings to innovative technologies that are making a huge impact on how we live every day, you're going to be amazed at what we're going to show you. Hello and welcome to Discover Wisconsin. This episode of Discover Wisconsin, America's Dairyland, is brought to you by the Dairy Farm Families of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board. America's Dairyland is your land. Hi everyone, welcome to Discover Wisconsin. I'm Mariah Hopperman. Ever stop to think how we became known as America's Dairyland? Well, today we're gonna show you some of the ways this $26.5 billion industry has shaped Wisconsin into what it is today. Our state's dairy industry is continually evolving and changing. We're gonna show you how. Drive across Wisconsin and you'll likely see the familiar red barns and silos, cows grazing on pastures, and milk trucks driving from farm to creamery. But that just scratches the surface of the dairy industry. Wisconsin is at the forefront and I believe in a leading position in terms of our dairy industry and infrastructure. If you look at the number of world-class international corporations that are based here in Wisconsin, it is second to none in the United States. It's a tremendously vital industry and we, we tend to forget about all of the businesses in addition to farms that make up this industry. Now we're going to discover a lot of ways the dairy industry is changing and evolving to keep pace with the rest of the world. But this first one may really surprise you. Do you have any idea what fish and lettuce have to do with the Wisconsin dairy industry? You might be surprised at the connection. Let's find out. One doesn't usually connect cows and fish to a greenhouse, but the Vries family did. Back in 2007, John and his wife Pam, along with their partner Steve Meyer, built a greenhouse across from their dairy farm. Just like any other business, whether you're an automotive maker or any other manufacturing plant, which is really what we are, if you don't evolve, you're not going to be in this business. With a herd just over a thousand strong, the Vrieses were already producing great milk, but wanted to get more out of the cow's second most valuable asset, manure. A farm this size could actually produce enough energy to heat probably a thousand homes. Wow. So it's a big number, it's not just an insignificant number. It's also something that we never thought of 20, 30 years ago about doing these kinds of things on a dairy farm, providing energy for the community. But now with new technology coming along and implementing it, we can really provide a lot of renewable energy. Methane generated from the dairy fuels a 27,000 square foot greenhouse across the street where they grow lettuce, herbs, and even fish. So Pam, we were just over at the Baldwin Dairy Farm across the road. Can you talk a little bit about what you guys are doing over there and how it connects to what we're seeing right here? Well, with the digester and being able to use the methane, um, that hot water comes to this facility and heats um, the water and the fish here to keep it at that optimal temperature mm -hmm. and also heats the um, facility in the wintertime. We are part aquaponic, which is the aquaculture, the fish being combined with the hydroponic, the growing in water. That's the aquaponic mm -hmm. where the fish affluent is actually the fertilizer for those plants. It's all kind of interconnected. Mm -hmm. It's yep. interesting. Correct. Very yes. cool. Yes. Just as the waste from the cows provides heat for the greenhouse, the waste from the fish naturally helps fertilize the plants in the greenhouse. All of the lettuce and herbs start out as seedlings. This is our seedling area. This is where we start our plants. We actually seed them all by hand, and then they are in what we call our propagation table for a week to 10 days until they have that nice root system and are ready to be planted out to the main greenhouse area. So it's like a little nursery for lettuce. Yes, almost. absolutely, <laughs> yes, that is what it is. The seedlings go from the propagation table to the growing pools, where the plants will mature as they float on styrofoam platforms. We can look at the root system here if you'd like. Oh, interesting. Huh. So that's the root, nice clean root. And it, you know, it's growing in the water. It draws up all the water and nutrient that it needs through the root. A very cool way the dairy industry is evolving, diversifying, and changing. It's a daily evolution. It's not a generational 
evolution anymore because of how fast things are happening. So from cow to digester, to fish, to vegetables, the full circle of farming is being used on the Vries Farm. See more photos, videos, and links about Future Farm by logging on to discoverwisconsin.com and searching America's Dairyland. What does this building have to do with the dairy industry? You might be surprised. Stay tuned and find out next. Welcome back to America's Dairyland as we continue to explore our dairy evolution. It's not every day that a new cheese plant opens up in Wisconsin. So when Clock Shadow Creamery was built in Milwaukee in 2012, it made news because it was Wisconsin's first urban cheese factory. And if that isn't a clear distinction, the building itself is. Now, most of us, when we look at a building, we just see brick and mortar. But if you look at this building here, see something quite different. Let's go inside and check it out. Master cheesemaker Bob Wills founded Clock Shadow Creamery. A Milwaukee native, Wills grew up about a mile south of the current location in Walker's Point. So, tell me about the building, tell me about the creamery here. So, Clock Shadow Creamery is Milwaukee's first and only cheese factory. And uh, it's in the greenest uh, building in the city, I think. We have all kinds of ecologically beneficial aspects to the place and I'd like to show you around. Fantastic. I hear there's some reclaimed wood uh, even on the countertops here. Is that correct? Yeah, the side of the counters here is floorboards from the Paps Brewery. Okay. And uh, yeah, and it, and it continues all the way through the building. More than half of the building materials in this building came from other buildings in the city that have been taken down. So they have pickleboard siding and, and the traditional Cream City brick from Milwaukee. And I hear that um, on top of the building here, there's a really unique rooftop, is that correct? There is, we have a garden on the roof that collects rainwater, and if you want to go and see it, I'd be happy to take you up there. Let's do it, it's a beautiful day, let's head outside. Right. Good deal. Clock Shadow Creamery occupies the first floor. The rest of the five-story building houses medical clinics, community organizations, and a law firm. A rooftop garden offers a beautiful view of Milwaukee's south side, including the Allen Bradley Clock Tower that inspired the building's name. So Bob, we're on your rooftop here. This has got green all over the place. What's going on here? Well, you know, this is a, a both a functional area and an educational area and a therapeutic area. The roof of this building is designed, first of all, to absorb and use as much water as it can so there's not runoff. And what, what does get through all this plant and gardening things um, is collected as, as rainwater in the basement and then used to feed the toilets in the building. We have um, a farmer's market here on Saturday mornings. We bring student groups up and they get to learn, you know, city kids get to learn about all this wide variety of plants and, and where their food comes from. It's even possible that what's grown in the rooftop garden may end up in the cheeses Clock Shadow Creamery makes. But we were also looking at what the impact was on the community because we're right next to one of the greatest lakes in the world. We want to protect the quality of the water um, here, and part of that is making sure that the runoff isn't, isn't damaging the, the uh, system. Besides being so accessible, the environmentally friendly building is made with more than 50% recycled materials and is designed to be a net zero energy user. Even the elevators in this place are unique. Bob, tell me about this elevator here. Yeah, so Otis designed this elevator that um, works kind of like a hybrid car, and so it has to break against gravity when it's lowering you down so you don't fall rapidly. And it runs a generator and creates electricity, which then helps it to go back up again. So I've thought about everything here. The, we're using all green energy. We've got the insulation that all that roofing provides. We have 27 geothermal wells underneath here that do our heating and cooling. So the net effect is that we use 50% less electricity and 60% less water than a normal building would do. So it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's awesome. Thanks to the innovative spirit of Bob Wills, this little urban creamery is making a difference in the community by providing food, energy, and a minimal carbon footprint. Check out more of Clock Shadow Creamery's story and find out where you can buy their cheese by logging on to discoverwisconsin.com and choosing destination America's Dairyland. Coming up... What do road salt and snow plows have to do with the dairy industry? Stay with us and you'll find out. Welcome back to America's Dairyland as we discover all the fascinating ways our dairy industry has evolved. What comes to mind when you think about Wisconsin? 
Odds are you probably said cheese. What may surprise you is that the dairy industry has a connection to the Department of Transportation. Let's head to Polk County to find out how. Does cheese making have anything to do with how we drive? In the winter, it does, and you'll be surprised to find out how. One of the byproducts of some types of cheese making is a brine solution that helps flavor cheese. FNA Dairy in Dresser, Wisconsin uses that brine to help give flavor to its mozzarella cheese, but disposing of salt brine could present a challenge. So they partnered with the Polk County Highway Department to come up with a cheesy solution to cut costs on salting roads in winter. Uh, we have to kind of get rid of it one way or another, and this way it's kind of a way that we, we help the county the counties around us and the towns around us can use the brine water. The highway department started mixing FNA Dairy's cheese brine with rock salt to see how the solution would perform. Take me back to your Eureka moment. How did you, first of all, even come up with this? And then when you discovered that it actually worked, what, were your, what was your reaction? Well, back in 2008, we were looking for ways to trim costs on materials and save money, naturally, with budgets. And um, one, one thing we were looking at was doing more with liquids with anti-icing. And we didn't have our own salt brine maker, so um, thinking about um, different things, came up with, well, when they, when they make cheese, they use salt water to cure this cheese. Um, why wouldn't that work? And that led us to testing with DNR to uh, get our permit to try a test study they wanted to do first. So 2008, 2009, we did a, a study on state highways and one county highway and finally got the okay in 2009 where we went countywide using cheese brine to pre-wet our salt sand and, and our salt. Only in Wisconsin, only right? In, only in Wisconsin, <laughs> yes. Recycling the brine solution also benefits FNA Dairy who supplies brine to Polk County and other surrounding areas. I've heard that Milwaukee County is kind of following suit. They're experimenting with cheese brine as well, right? Yes, this That's... year they are doing a pilot study. Um, they came up actually to FNA Dairy to Polk County and got 600 gallons of brine to try in a neighborhood down in Milwaukee. That must feel pretty neat to be at the forefront of this innovation, huh? Yeah, it's, it's a very proud feeling um, to get Polk County's name out there and to have so many people interested in this process that's not only helping us, you know, have safer highways, but helping the dairy recycle and get rid of one of their waste products. With little environmental impact, the real benefit is cheese brine's effect as it hits the icy roads. Turns out, the cheesy mixture sticks well to roads and freezes at a lower temperature than regular salt brine. Introducing liquid into with a salt, um, we can save 30% um, on material usage due to if you put dry salt on a highway, you'll lose 30% to just bouncing off the highway. This kind of sticks it to the highway and starts it activating faster. It's a solution that benefits everyone. FNA Dairy saves over $20,000 in hauling and disposal costs. Polk County saves over $40,000 in rock salt costs. And Wisconsin roads are safer for all of us to travel. Log on to discoverwisconsin.com and choose Destination America's Dairyland for more information on this innovative solution for icy roads. Up next. This may look like ordinary fiberboard, but you won't believe what it's really made of. Stay tuned and we'll find out. We're back in America's Dairyland, where our dairy evolution continues. Farmers traditionally use manure to fertilize their fields, but as dairy farms grow, farmers are looking for more ways to recycle their manure. We're here at the USDA Forest Products Lab in Madison. You'd think this would be the last place you'd find a connection to the dairy industry, but there is. Let's take a look. When most people think of manure, they think of the smell. Not John Hunt of the USDA Forest Products Lab. He's excited about the opportunities he sees for this waste product. Now see this stuff, this isn't fresh from the farm, is it? It, it is, it's oh. fresh, no, you can- Wait a minute, it doesn't even smell. No, it's straight from the farm, but it's straight from the anaerobic digester, and it's gone through for 22 to maybe 25 days in an anaerobic digester. It has eaten up all the bad stuff, so to, so to speak, <laughs> and what's, what's left is the cellulose. And this is the recycled paper fiber. It's also wood. It's also cellulose. And but so this is office paper, right? This is office paper. It's de-inked office paper. And so we're adding this material with that to make a board. It's just that just went through a cow, and this just went through an office. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. 
During the year, John makes visits to the Stotts Farm in Sun Prairie. He gathers dried manure solids from their anaerobic digester. John uses this digested solid material to create particle board. This essentially is the way before picture of everything. Yeah. Right? Well, and, and it shows that we can make paper. I mean, it can be as thin as a paper, sheet of paper. What percent manure is this paper? This is 50% okay. manure, 50% recycled corrugated. And so it forms well, it, it produces a really nice sheet. The other thing is, uh, you know, this just shows sort of what I was saying with the corrugated. This panel uh, has the, the core the, and the two faces are made again of a 50% uh, recycled corrugated, 50% uh, manure. And then we just bond those panels together into a structure that could be used for an office section, uh, wall section, uh, for a variety of applications. Manure cubicles. <laughs> That's right. Manure fibers naturally bond together, so there's no need for resins to be added to help form the board. There are no odors, the boards are equally as strong as traditional wood fiber boards, and manure fibers have other benefits as well. Why cow manure? I mean, what are the benefits to, to having this versus, say, a traditional wood from trees? It really is a replacement of a wood fiber. So it's a, it's a green material, it's recyclable, it's a renewable source of fiber. Cows eat 24-7. It's so a pretty you, inexhaustible supply, That's right? right. As long as you have cows, you're going to have a supply of fiber. How durable is this stuff? I mean, if it gets really hot or if it gets really wet, does anything happen to okay. So as long as you protect it, it will behave the same way as any other particle board uh, material from wood. So the stability of the, the product uh, is equal or the, is the same as a wood product. I mean, it, you know, a, a particle board, fiber board product. If you wanted to take it outside, you would need to cover it. You would then need to start adding some resins. For right now, it needs to be covered, needs to be inside, uh, away from a lot of water. It's also a benefit, because if you use it in the way that you say, I'm done with it now, I want to recycle it. All you have to do is you take this product, throw it back into a, what's called a hydropulper, and we can make another product. That's true, it's very recyclable. It's very no recyclable. From the manure digester to the structures we build, these products could serve many industries, as well as benefiting the environment by helping to recycle a waste product. Here in Wisconsin, we're lucky to benefit in so many different ways from our dairy industry. It's a field that's constantly changing and evolving in ways we may not yet know, or may not have yet thought possible. You know, it sure is interesting to think about all the different ways the dairy industry impacts our daily lives, from the food we eat, to renewable resources, to travel, to even the homes we live in. It's not always so obvious, but it's all around us. I'm Eric Paulson, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week as we continue to Discover Wisconsin. This episode of Discover Wisconsin, America's Dairyland, is brought to you by the Dairy Farm Families of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board. America's Dairyland is your land.